Well, good afternoon um, and welcome to this, um, the third of our technical webinars um, for the end of our um, results-based payments on Common Land project. Um, those of you who are with us on Monday night, actually, and um, the observant amongst you will realize that this isn't um, Helen Barnes speaking, um, and that this actually isn't a recording of the, the meeting on Monday night. We had tef um, technical difficulties with the meeting, um, and so we've decided to, um, to re-record uh, an event, a webinar, um, because we, it's important, I think, to get the, um, the things we want to get across on record and to be available on YouTube. Um, so apologies for those of you who did attend um, Monday's meeting. Um, and uh, I hope um, I'm able to cover the, the, the material as well as Helen. Um, there were some questions raised in Monday's meeting, so I'll try my best um, to address those in the, the talk. I should say that Helen is out um, in Blaine Gwent today um, scoring a common. Okay, um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so the, um, this webinar is the, the third, as I said, of a, a series of, of three. Um, the project that we're doing is trying to develop a, a results-based approach um, to supporting the sustainable management of common land. Um, it's funded by um, six um, leader local action groups in South Wales um, and by uh, Natural Resources Wales. And the project was inspired by um, the Welsh Government's Brexit in Our Land consultation paper, in which they said that their intention was in future um, to deliver agricultural support through a single scheme um, that rewarded the, the delivery of public goods. Um, and we know, as we've said in other webinars, that that's a, a big challenge in itself, um, but particularly so in the case of commons. <clears throat> for a number of reasons which we've also gone into in the past. Um, so the, the first of our um, webinars um, de uh, dealt with those public goods. Um, and then the second dealt with um, how we might look at payments. Uh, and so tonight's meeting is going to, or this afternoon's meeting as it is, um, is going to look at how, to, um, how that was transferred into a scorecard. Um, and then next week we'll look at um, the process and what that means for things like advice and capacity building within Commons. <clears throat> um, so our project started um, 13 months ago um, and the process of applying for the funding um, started a long time before that. Um, but we feel it's still relevant um, because Welsh Government has just put out a, a, a way forward, a forward plan um, for its reform process in which it says that common land um, is really important. Um, it should have greater attention, as it says there. Um, but that alongside that aspiration, um, there's still really a, a gap of ideas of how this could be done. Um, and they're looking to develop what they say they're the evidence base with stakeholders. <coughs> Excuse me. So our intention is to, to very much to feed into that process. OK. so. Um, this seminar, in this seminar, we'll, we'll deal with scorecards. Um, so there'll be a bit of an introduction. We'll talk about the scope of the scorecard. So what the scorecard um, is and what it isn't. And then we'll, we'll talk about um, how to, to prepare before going out to score a common. Uh, and then we'll talk about the scorecard itself and go through it um, and how to use it. Um, so the overall aim of this part of the of the project is to produce a, a, a scorecard which is easy to understand, which is workable, and um, which is repeatable. That means also is auditable, of course, um, and which um, in a standardized way, a way which can be rolled out time and again, um, reflects a commons quality. And the commons quality, of course, not just with regard to one public good, but with the whole package of public goods as we explored in the first webinar. Um, and that scorecard also is the thing that connects that um, quality assessment to an appropriate payment. And we described that in the second webinar, how we went about that. Um, and the idea is, of course, that it's not a static thing. Um, 
it's something that graziers can respond to um, and that the scorecard indicates um, to an extent at least the kind of things that graziers might do to improve their common score and uh, thereby their payments um, so we should say that the um, the card isn't coming from um, thin air it builds on a lot of excellent work um, essential work we couldn't have done it without them um, in Ireland first and then uh, more recently in Scotland um, and it's also been um, the subject of ongoing discussions which are continuing so with West government and NRW and um, with farming organizations with local specialists a lot of them actually um, and also of course very importantly with graziers um, so if graziers think that the the card is um, unworkable or um, too opaque then of course it's not a good card that's a that's the essential final test so i thought i would just start um by making a a very important point about the scope of the scorecard <clears throat> so we said in our first webinar that we think that all the public goods can be brought together um, into a fairly coherent picture uh, and that that potentially is is measurable um, and so we can imagine a spectrum as we show there on the slide um, from really bad on the one side to superb on the other side um, the best that there is and that's the real world um, the card doesn't attempt to cover the whole of that spectrum so the card doesn't look for the extraordinary um, it doesn't look for the unique it doesn't look for the the very rarest of species um, if those things need particular attention then they should get particular attention um, specific attention targeted attention what the card is doing is giving uh, a broad platform of signal um, that addresses the broad um, the broad spectrum mo the majority of the kind of land that we will encounter on commons that's our aim um, and that's not something that i think we apologize for i think that's a deliberate thing uh, and that is a separate question it's very important to say from this question of whether the card actually reflects well um, true condition so what true condition is is perhaps not as fixed a, a thing as we might uh, we might imagine um, but assuming that there is such a thing as a as a fixed absolute um, measure of condition the question of whether the card addresses it is a separate question from whether the card addresses all conditions which it doesn't attempt to do that's very important i think so the card works by giving positive scores for positive messages and negative scores for negative messages um, that might seem obvious um, but our colleagues in ireland some of the cards there um, they give positive scores for not doing negative things so we don't think that that helps the clarity of the message uh, and so that's something we've avoided um, and so the way the, the positive scores work in our card we'll we'll come down to them in more detail later but just to give you an overall picture is first of all we're looking for species richness so species richness is the most unusual thing we can say the the, the thing that's um, in some ways for biodiversity is is really valuable and makes for uniqueness actually um, makes for sites uh, probably being designated um, are associated with the priority features within those sites according to the designations and so we look for that first um, and if a site is species rich then we also look at the structure as we do uh, in every site and if that structure is optimal then that's enough you can actually get a score of 10 um, just through that um, if it's not optimal then the, the card um, tells you to improve it and if you improve it then you'll get these high scores um, and so um, we have a number of species and um, antils actually also count as species in this case um, and those um, high scoring areas would get high payments and that's actually how it is in Glastier um, so um, 
calcare grassland or coastal grasslands, let's say, which can be really species rich, they're the ones that get the highest payments. There, and we reflect that in our card. Um, but if it's not so species rich, that's not the end of the line. And so our card then asks uh, another series of questions, um, which uh, also reflect other priorities within public policy. Um, so heathlands, for example, are a, a, a priority habitat within the Environment Act. And so our next set of questions asked about heathiness. So is it heathy? How heathy is it? Um, how diverse is the heath, the number of heath species? And what are the structures of the heath? Um, and again, if you get good scores in that, um, you can move your scores up the, um, up the table of scores and get a higher payment. There's also a, a, a realization now that um, trees are important and that we need more trees and that on some habitats at least, there should be more trees. It would be a benefit to biodiversity and to other things for there to be more trees. And so again, if there's a, a, a not so species rich area, we ask a question about trees. So what number of trees are present uh, and how much natural regeneration is there? And depending on the type of habitat, um, we either award presence or we award presence and regeneration um, or we reward presence and don't reward regeneration or we reward presence and um, penalize regeneration. There's all sorts of um, different messages there depending on the type of habitat we have. Um, and that's a subtlety that we've got from um, discussing with NRW um, and from looking at published documentation. Um, but throughout it, um, we've tried to make it that structure is really important um, for two reasons, really. So the one is the one that we have here, that um, whichever public goods we've looked at, structure is always a key element, um, whether it's flow regulation, whether it's fire risk management, um, whether it's some forms of pollution, even um, carbon storage, all these kind of things, structure is important. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is the structure is what graziers can really change. Um, so they can't change the, the species in the, in the sward, or at least it would be very difficult to change it, and it would take a long time. Um, but structure potentially can be changed um, at short notice um, and can give a, a real incentive in the card over a very short period. Um, just to remind ourselves from um, last week's um, talk of this on the on the scores, um, not all habitats in in effect are using the whole of the card. So if you remember um, do that, uh, the scores of ten, as we explained just now, um, are limited to really species rich areas, which also have good structure. Um, and that will be things like calcareous grassland. So you can have a really poor calcareous grassland getting a score of zero or half or one, um, but a good one should get a score of 10. Um, and that should get a really high payment, just as it does in Glastier just now, because it needs a lot of um, livestock management, uh, a high density of livestock, and that's where the costs come in. Um, whereas a heathland, uh, even a good heathland, will get a score that's in the middle of the, uh, of the scoring matrix, um, because there the stocking density is lower. Um, and of course, the, the payments for capital works aren't included in this, this area payment anyway. Um, and so a, a heathland maybe could range from zero to five or zero to six, depending what it is. So that's quite an important thing to say. So it's not that uh, a heathland is a failure. If it gets a score of six, a score of six is really good for a heathland. Um, but it just reflects the, the kind of money that you'd expect a good heathland to be able to secure. Okay. So you can't just turn up at a common uh, and start scoring. Not if you want to do it um, meaningfully and repeatably and auditably and all these things that we mentioned. So you need to do some preparation. Um, and there are quite a few resources out there um, which can at least help you in your preparation, even though I think you'll find that none of them um, give you the whole answer before you go. Um, there's a lot of gaps there um, and a lot of um, 
reading between the lines you have to do and reality is always a bit different but you should prepare um so the obvious first thing of course is satellite photos um so there's a lot of different satellite images out there not just google earth um there's um maps you can use of course online um and then there's there's functions you can use um to help you um to locate the places that you want to go um so what three words is a is one that's um, very popular these days. On a, a small number of commons, there's um, some specific books or publications or papers or surveys that have been done. Um, and those can be very helpful, of course. Um, and then on designated sites, there is uh, some information out there on the NRW website. Um, so special areas for conservation in particular, they have um, management plans and the management plans often have maps in them, you know, compartment maps um, with quite detailed descriptions of the compartments and what the pros and cons of the, the condition are just now um, and giving some metrics of um, how things could improve. So those are very helpful. Um, and then in, in triple size, which aren't SECs, of course, you have um, these um, visions and the citation documents, they're rather more vague usually. It's not always clear um, what the state is compared to the ideal, um, but they still give you a good um, picture of, of what to expect. Um, and then there's two very useful um, but limited sources. So first of all, we're dealing with common land. And in the 1990s, there was a, a, a comprehensive series of surveys done on all the, the significant areas of common land in Wales by the um, field unit in the geography department in Aberystwyth. Um, and that was the biological survey of common land. Um, so it's only available on paper, um, volumes like this, um, one for each county. Um, and the information on them varies. Um, they all have maps, they all have some um, phase one areas. They all have a bit of a description, but in some cases it's really detailed, uh, and in some cases it's rather more skeletal. Um, and at the same time, more or less, there was phase one um, habitat maps being done um, for the whole of Wales again, um, and that's available online. You can be downloaded and used in your own um, GIS system, um, and that's on uh, Lle. Uh, and again, that's patchy. Some of it is um, really high quality and some of it is rather more dubious. So you'd need to go with a, an open mind. Um, not Don't take it to be um, gospel and not least, of course, because it's 30 years old. Um, and then finally, the, the wildlife trusts um, and the biological record centres, they also have a plethora of information, um, but it's not really that easy to get hold of and it may carry a cost. Um, and our approach in general, I think, is not to depend on things which are um, only available for some areas, you know, which are only uh, giving the level of detail in some areas so that other areas um, fall short. We want to have a method that works everywhere. Um, and that's what I think we, we have achieved. So, so the biological survey and the phase one is available everywhere, for example. Um, so they are very useful tools, but the other things, they're just icing on the cake. So you've done your preparation, you have some idea um, of what's out there. Um, these are just two examples of, of publications from individual commons. So this is a very excellent book um, by David Barden, just came out last year, um, of the wild plants of Francisan Common and uh, the uh, Guayra, which is a, a private piece of land next door. Um, which contains maps, it contains descriptions of communities, it contains descriptions of typical flowers in those communities. It's a very, very useful book. Um, and then this is an example on the right of um, uh, an innovation plan, a commons management plan that was produced um, for the, the Manid Main um, Commoners Association. And that also contains uh, a lot of useful information. But as I say, um, we don't want a methodology that um, falls flat because most commons don't have this kind of information to hand. This is um, a photocopy of part of the 
uh, entry from the biological survey um, for Tlantasant. Um, so as you can see, it's it's got a, a, a black and white map in it um, with um, uh, phase one communities. Uh, so they may have changed, of course, but you know the hydrology will be more or less the same, and the, the underlying geology will be the same. So there'll be some um, some reflection to reality, and of course, if they're different to reality, then that gives you some indication potentially of how things have changed since then, what trends there are. Um, so these are definitely very useful, um, very useful publications, and they can give you some idea of you know where the the blocks of marshy grassland are and the blocks of um, pasture and the blocks of heath, etc. before you go. Um, this is a rather fuzzy um, image of the same area. Um, and this is the phase one map. Um, so I've taken out the, the non semi natural communities there, but that's the that's the, the result. Uh, and again, it's very useful as a, a primer really before you go out there to suggest and what kind of blocks there are and what your strategy might be as you decide where you're going to survey. <coughs> Excuse me. So our aim in this, um, in this survey is to give uh, an accurate, a meaningful picture of the true state of the common, but with the minimum amount of effort that's possible. Um, and that means, of course, that we have to have a certain amount of data points. So if we only have one data point, the chance of us uh, representing the reality is really, really small. Uh, and of course, if we if we survey the whole common, then our the chance of doing it is perfect. Um, but we can't afford the time that it takes to do that number of samples. So we we'll want our sampling to be up here somewhere. Um, and what that number is, is not really clear to us. We, even at the end of the project, we're not clear about that. And that's something I think that in testing um, would need to be uh, looked into further. So we're suggesting, for example, that you might have um, 10 points per square kilometer minimum. Um, so that's 10 points per 100 hectares. Um, but when you think that, um, our largest common is Buckland, that's um, five and a half thousand hectares. So that still means, you know, 550 points. So that's quite a lot of work. But is that enough? Is that not enough? Um, we want our answer to be meaningful. Um, but we're not looking at all the detail. You know, the, the card is meant to give a general picture. And it's meant to create a uh, a response from graziers which is at a significant scale uh, and you if that doesn't make a difference um, to the points then it's not a significant enough scale um, so we only need to be able to measure it at the scale that it happens so we don't need to be at the minutiae but we still need to be realistic and that's the challenge and one that i think as i say does need to be looked at further if the thing is developed so how might we achieve whatever uh, density of sampling we think we need? Um, so one way of doing it is in the top left here. Um, so a random walk. Um, so you could design this from, from the start. You could look at the air photo and think, oh, well, okay, there's a green bit here. There's a brown bit there. There's a light brown bit there. So I need to cover them all. Um, but the larger the place becomes, the more difficult it is to be confident that your random walk is representative, I would say. Um, now, it can be done um, with GIS monitoring. In other words, it can be uh, recorded so that it's repeatable. So that's not so much the issue. Um, but how do you do it? Do you just record, record, record as you go? Or do you stop? Or it's, it's not so easy. So this is the approach that we've been taking so far in Scotland. Um, and when really not sure if it's suitable for, for large parcels, the more we, more we think about it. Um, so one alternative, of course, is to use a grid. So you just um, have your number of points at whatever density is needed so that you have the right number of points for the right area. Um, and then you go to these points and, and record there. Um, so that is possible. Um, 
it's sometimes difficult because of access issues or you know dangerous land or whatever um, and of course some of the features um, on the the commons they could be linear um, so you, you could miss them completely so for example here in this common there's a strip of limestone that comes through here um, so you could imagine uh, uh, a grid um, way of doing it completely missing out on this linear feature of limestone um, so it seems that random points have their have their um, merits, and that's the approach we've taken. Um, but then we're also recognizing that there are um, certain blocks of vegetation which seem to be um, meaningful when you look at their photos or when you look in the ground. Uh, and so in this case, there's an obvious brown uh, wadge here, and there's obviously a less brown wadge here, and there's a some green land here and there's some land with trees there um, and so we're trying to be pragmatic present this is the the way we're doing it i don't know if you can see it if my face is in the way there um, so the current view that we have is that we decide on a total number of stops um, and then we divide them by area between the blocks we can see on the images and or the habitat map um, and then within those blocks, we scatter them randomly. Um, and we're not using um, square meters um, sampling points. We're using um, within 10 meters of the point. And if, if you think about it, um, pi r squared, so it's, it's over 314 square meters. So it's quite a large area at each sample point. Uh, and we're saying we should have a, a fixed time to score them. So we're saying five minutes per stop. So that's a sort of balance we're trying to make. We're not saying it's perfect and we're not saying it's the final word on things and um, people might try it more and, and get another answer and we're quite open to that, but that's our suggestion at present. So on this question of, of blocks, this is an extract from David Baden's book uh, and David Baden quite um, nicely says, oh, um, here at A we've got, um, at A, We've got bright green of dominant young bracken, and there it is. Um, and then in B, we've got the olive green of dominant soft rush. But then when you look at the real satellite image, um, knowing what David Baden has found on the ground there, it's not so clear where the blocks are really. Um, and so even though we're stressing that preparation is really important, it's uh, it may be the case that when you get on the ground, you'll have to vary what you initially thought, but still with this mindset of, you know, how many, um, what percentage of the area does this block represent and then giving it the, the requisite number of, of stops and no more and no less. So this is two examples from um, Kevin Gurid of, of a, um, the same hillside. Um, and you can see that there's very different um, qualities of vegetation may or may not be marked on the map, but it's quite clear there's a, a line here and that there's that type of vegetation and then there's this type and that type might be different from that type. Um, and so you have to be um, reactive, you have to be um, realistic um, according to what the ground tells you when you go there, having prepared. That's the way to say it maybe. And so we're saying when you're out in the common, you go to the these um, blocks that you identify tentatively and you select random assessment points there, which are representative of a block. Um, so if there's something that's clearly different, then you move your, you move your point to, the, to some extent. Um, and again, bearing in mind the total number of points that that block needs, so that it really is representative. <clears throat> when you've found your point, then you fix its location. Um, so you can use what three words or just the GPS coordinates. Uh, and then you take a photo. Uh, and we've got a we've got a draft um, app that we're using. Um, it's not all singing or dancing, but it's just as a, a demonstration. Um, so David Jones um, kindly developed that for us using EpiCollect, which is a software freely available. Um, and that also takes um, the location of the um, of the plot if you use it on your smartphone. Um, and then what you find as we go through the scorecard that most of the questions relate to this area within 10 meter of the center of those points. And as I said, you spend five minutes recording it. So during the testing process, of course, there's you're asking more questions. So we're asking to what extent the card itself 
we think reflects the, the stated objectives for that site and for that habitat. Um, so does it give the right signals? Does it give the right rewards? Is it underscoring? Is it overscoring? So that's the kind of question we're asking during development. Um, but then, of course, during rollout, um, if a farmer is doing it especially, or if a farm advisor is doing it, then at each point you'd be thinking, well, okay, where are we going short here? Okay, the thing will be produced in a table at the end by the app. But um, yeah, where are we going short? Um, what does it mean here when we say that structure is, is poor? What, um, what um, amelioration could we do? What, what could we do? Well, how could we change our management um, to maybe change the score? That's the kind of um, engagement that the card is meant to encourage um, on an ongoing basis every year. So um, there's been other projects where um, there's been a lot of cards. Uh, and one of the things you have to do early on is choose which card you're going to use. Um, when I was working in the, the Scottish pilot, I was working with um, people who are now advisors, former colleagues of mine when I was an advisor, um, and um, Helen Barnes in this project is also an advisor. Um, and as advisors, we don't really like that kind of question um, because even though the intention is, of course, that there's, it doesn't make any difference which um, card you choose, you should get the same, core, uh, same score from both cards. The reality is that that isn't really how it works in practice. Uh, and so choice of cards creates a choice of, of um, options, one of which probably pays better than the other, and, and which you as an advisor, being as you're human and you're working for your client, want to go and choose. Yeah? Uh, and the auditor might make a different choice. And that's uh, really not a happy place to be in. We've, we've been in that place in reality in other schemes. Um, and so we don't want to have too many cards within our package. Uh, but having said that, there are some places which are really different um, and where those different areas can be clearly um, identified um, and where the particular needs of those areas maybe are well suited to being in a separate card. Um, so this is um, one such example at the bottom here. This is Pennard Common. The boundary is the is the river, or I think it's a common on the other side as well. But this is Pennard Common on this side, um, and as you can see, there's a large area of salt marsh there. Um, so salt marsh is determined by the high tide. Um, it's quite a distinctive vegetation community, and so we have a separate card actually for salt marsh. Um, and here is a woodland, um, a really nice woodland actually, um, uh, calcareous woodland. Um, and that's also a very distinctive community, so long as we can um, determine where the boundary of it is. That's not so easy in this case, but um, it needs different things, and we, we're happy to have a, a separate card for that. So we do have a few um, separate cards, and the start of the scorecard um, tries to identify those things that we'll treat separately. Um, so if part of the area is a salt marsh, then we have a salt marsh card. Um, if part of the area is... Um, dominated by land which is currently not BPS eligible, um, land which is not maintained by grazing, um, then we want to identify that. Um, we have a question um, that tries to identify land which we'll use a bog card for. Um, so we don't want to you know, dwell on that just now, um, but just to say it's not a deep heat uh, measuring card, uh, measuring criteria, it's a vegetation criteria. We think that's very important. Um, we have a a question that asks, is it woodland? And we'll have a woodland card for that. Um, and then we have a, a dispensation um, that maybe today is not the time to go into it for um, exotic species, um, invasive exotics, um, large areas of them. So we have a, a, a facility on the card to, to fence those off, um, in, 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 mentally fence those off anyway, um, so that we, we don't attend to them using the card and that we stop things spreading from them. Maybe that's not the approach that we should take, but that's, that's how we are just now. And we'll explain that in our report. Uh, and if none of these apply, then we use the general scorecard. So it's the general scorecard that I'll describe to you from now on. 
So the scorecard starts, as I as I indicated earlier, by looking at species richness. So just the the presence of of indicator species, um, and these indicator species were chosen um, so that they occur uh, at different points in the quality scale. So there's some indicator species that you would expect to find really easily on even quite poor um, areas, uh, and then there's other species that you might find in better areas uh, or in the best areas. Um, and the species have been chosen to cover that spectrum, but to cover that spectrum, not just in one type of habitat. So for example, calcareous grassland, but also to cover it in, in wetland or in um, acid grassland or in neutral grassland. Um, so to give um, every habitat its fair shot, we might say. Um, so as you can see, I can move my picture again so that I can see it. Um, as we can see, as you can see here, the threshold is not particularly high, but but 15 is yeah, it's a lot of species, but it's not a, a huge, huge amount of species. Um, but remember, we're only looking for them within these um, 314 square meters. We're not it's not every time we see them. Um, one example, as we walk across the common, that's not the case. So we have to bring our expectations down um, anyway. That's how we're doing it. Um, but we're only giving, um, as you see, we're only giving a maximum of two out of 10 for that. Um, so species diversity is important and you can only um, get over the line to get a score of 10 if you have this high score. Um, but on the other hand, it's not the, the be all and end all because remember, we're not just looking at biodiversity here, we're looking at the whole package of public goods. Um, and we know that structure is very important um, for other elements of this package. Um, so let's just have a look of some of the species. These aren't all of them. So these are from S to Y, as you can see. Um, and there's more, obviously, from A to S. Uh, so that's the kind of species we've got on the card. Um, they're not um, hard species to identify. Um, and in many cases, we've lumped things together so that similar things um, all get the score. Um, Sometimes there might be rare things um, which could be included, but we don't mind. We'll, we'll give the score for that. Um, but we've tried to avoid putting in a rare thing for which a, a common thing can be confused. So we tried to make it as, as user friendly as possible um, while being as meaningful as we can. Um, so we're not um, leaving the farmer and the advisor um, without help. So we've, we've got a, a crib sheet um, to go along with that. And so these are just some uh, for the violets, pansies, vetches, vegetables. Um, so there's there's pictures for everything that's on the card and that's on other elements of the, the card as well that include species. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's the that's the presence of species, uh, of herbaceous species, I should say. Um, and then there's a question of um, structure. So um, potentially eight out of the 10 points are available for this structure question. Um, in Scotland, we, we found this really difficult actually, um, determining what good structure was. Um, and in Wales, we have an advantage that the, the Glastil guidance in many cases gives us more information on this than we have anywhere else actually, even though it wasn't part of the, the prescription of Glastil. Um, there's stuff in the guidance that tells you what the prescription is trying to achieve. And so we were able to use that in our, um, in our, in our uh, scorecard and to differentiate then between different types of habitat that we find. And so we've got a, we've got a kind of questionnaire within a questionnaire in which we're asking what kind of um, things are there within this um, 314 square meters. Um, so one of the questions is, is it dominated by um, tall rushes. Uh, and if it is, then what kind of tall rushes are they? Are they rushes that have a flower at the side? Um, so like soft rush or conglomerate rush. So we're not asking farmers to identify what rush it is. We're just asking that simple question, do they have a flower at the side? Um, or if they don't, um, then we have another option here. So if they were, for example, sharp flower rush or um, jointed rush, then they would use this one down the bottom. But if they have a flower at the side, then we ask these questions. Um, and depending what the answer is, you see there's a there's a five-fold um, table here, even though we're not using all the five. 
in this particular case, and here we're only using one, but there's a five-fold table and we answer the question. Uh, and then we put the information into this main table. Um, so in the main table, um, we're looking at the, the frequency of species and the structure. Um, so what we found in Scotland was that when we looked just at the number of species, um, that was a poor indicator uh, of quality. Um, the just presence was not enough. Species had to be um, present at some numbers to indicate a good habitat. Uh, and a number of species had to be present in good numbers. Um, and we found in Scotland also um, that we couldn't separate out the species from the structure, not really very cleanly. So we were going to places in Scotland um, where the structure um, at first sight looked poor, but which were really, really species rich. Uh, and so we found ourselves always allowing the species to trump the structure. Uh, and so rather than having a card which um, didn't reflect um, that way of doing things, we thought we should try and reflect that in the card honestly. And if it's wrong, then it can, it can be changed. But that's the way we're really doing it. So let's really address how it's being done and change the reality of it if it needs to be changed. Um, and so we're looking again at the same at the same species as we looked at in the first question. So we're asking now. Is there one or more species present? Um, is there five or more present? Is there five or more common? And is there more than one abundant? Yeah, and is there more than five abundant? Um, and as you can see, um, as you would expect, the, the number of points you get increases down that column. Um, but also, it increases across the column. Um, and so if you have the optimal structure, you will always get a better score, whether your species are high or your species are low. That's something that's really integral to the card. Um, and so in the case of our um, rushes there, we, we might say, oh, there's only, um, there's maybe there's three species present. Okay, so we use this line here, uh, and then we look at the, the card, the score, and we come to a, a, a combined structure and um, species density score. Okay, so you remember, as I said in my summary, that um, if you have a high number of species, that's that's the end of it. You know, we're happy with that um, because that's that's unusual, that's rare, that's something that we want to value. And so you see, if you have a uh, the highest number of abundance, then you have a score of eight, so long as your structure is good. And eight plus two in the first question is ten. That's it. That's, that's the whole point. Um, but as I also said in my, um, my earlier um, card, there, my other slide, for lower species densities, um, that's not the end of the question. And so these ones that are in the, the white here, we ask further questions. Um, but before we get to that, we have one more question for the ones in green. And that um, arose because um, when we went out to um, Pennard with NRW, um, we found areas there that were um, really high in species density, uh, really high in the number of species, but where the invasion of Western Gorse was a real problem. Um, and so we're asking a question just about Western Gorse, um, for, even for these species rich habitats, um, in order to disincentivize um, areas that are over 50%. So the incentive, if they are, is to get at it because there's three points to gain from getting them below 50%. Okay. So that's the species rich ones, but if they're not species rich, then as I said before, then we go to ask about heathiness. Um, so we're asking how much there is in terms of, of heathy species. Um, and if it's a low amount, then we ask about structure. Uh, and if it's a high amount, then we ask about um, structure again. Um, and we also ask about uh, the number of, of heathy species which are there. Okay. Um, so again, Western Gorse is, a, is a, a, a thing we want. It's something that's very typical of Welsh commons. It's, it's called Welsh Gorse, after all, in its Latin name. Um, but it's, it's a, a real issue if it gets to be dominant. Um, and so we're happy for it to have uh, 
a significant amount of West Coast, but if it gets over 50%, it doesn't matter if the rest is good, then we really want action there. So we want to incentivize action. So the Western Coast is a, we have a bit of a split um, attitude to it, um, reflecting that complex, that, that complex um, role it has within the, the heaths. Then, as I say, we go to, to trees and shrubs. Um, so when we started off, we took this, the Scottish um, card again and started as a starting point. Uh, and there we, on the general card anyway, we encouraged trees up to a certain point and we rewarded um, the regeneration of trees up to a certain point. Uh, and beyond that point, we weren't penalizing them, but it was just an indication, maybe you're better off in the, in the woodland scheme, for example. Um, because there's a, a grazed woodland option in Scotland. <clears throat> um, but when we um, when we came to Wales and when we discussed things in real places with NRW staff, actually we got a very more a much more subtle message. Um, so there's some areas, um, for example, many blackened slopes, where you'd be quite happy to see trees. Um, you'd be happy to see regeneration of trees. Um, you'd be quite happy for the thing to go towards a wood pasture, for example. Um, but then there's other habitats um, where you don't want to see trees at all, actually. Um, so limestone grasslands would be like that. Um, you wouldn't want to see trees spreading on limestone grassland. And in fact, even if there was a significant number of trees there now, you ne wouldn't necessarily want to see them there because limestone grassland is so um, rare in Wales. Um, and it is a, a, a danger for it to get um, taken over by scrub. Uh, and so the, the incentive, the signal we were given is that the incentive should be uh, against having trees at all. Uh, and then there's other habitats which are in the middle um, where you don't mind seeing a few trees, um, but you know that it's a problem um, if they start expand, expanding. And that is actually something that's happening and which is leading to deterioration of habitat. So for example, on some of the uh, Gower commons, you see trees expanding onto wet heath um, in an inexorable way. Um, so we don't want to encourage that. That's the signal we're given and we think that makes sense. Uh, and so we have these two questions. So we have the first question about the, the number of trees. Um, and you can see in many cases, th this question is neutral, um, but in some cases it's um, giving a negative. Yeah? Whereas in other cases, um, it's giving a positive for having a few present. So that varies. Uh, and then it's, um, it's um, sorry. Ah, well, there is, a, there is a second question, it's not here, um, that asks a similar thing about, um, about natural regeneration. Uh, and so it, it's not the same pattern as this, it's a, but it's a complementary pattern to this, which reflects what I said there. Then we're asking a question about um, potentially dominating species. So these aren't exotic species, um, they are native species, um, but they can take over and once they take over it can be very difficult um, to bring the place back. Um, and so the attitude we have just now is not to penalize them, um, but to penalize them spreading. So if we see um, clear signs that um, bracken or brambles or sea buckthorn or whatever are spreading then there's a penalty um, but if they're just sitting there tidily we think that there's a they add to the the diversity of a common so a patch of brambles that's just um, not expanding that has a value for birds obviously and butterflies and invertebrates all sorts so we don't want to we're not trying to encourage a, a, a clearing up mentality um, but on the other hand we don't want it to be taking over either. These, these open habitats are some of what we, what we value within that common. Um, so here's a, a picture of, of an anthill. So that counts as some species <laughs> in our case. Um, and in this case, it's on a, a heathland and you can see that the, the heathland itself is quite diverse. Um, so there's ling there, there's um, crowberry there, there's bilberry there. Uh, and so that, that uh, that portion would get a high score, at least from the species uh, point of view. Um, and this is the kind of thing then we're looking for in millennia. So we're looking for signs of grazing. 
Um, the more signs of grazing, the better. Um, Molinia, we're not trying to get rid of Molinia. We're trying to um, encourage it um, to be as species rich as possible. Um, by drain blocking or whatever, we're encouraging it to be wet. And if it wants to be wet heath or if it wants to be bogged, then we're happy for it to go that way. Um, but we're not just against it just for being it. It is also part of the, the tapestry of a, a, a natural and a Welsh functioning um, Welsh common very often. Um, then we've got some um, a question about um, negative indicators. So these are things that are um, statutory weeds, for example. Um, they might be things associated with gates or with um, trackways or with feeding points, if such a thing exists. Um, so we're not against these. There's a value, obviously, to having some um, thistles. There's a value to having nettles. Um, but if we have large, large areas of them, then there's something wrong that it indicates something, some nutrient enrichment or disturbance or whatever. Um, and so we have a we have a, a tolerance of them, quite a high tolerance of them. Um, but if they're very large areas, then we penalize um, because they, they indicate that there's something wrong. Um, and then the final no, final three questions, two of them here. So we're asking what the impact is of artificial drainage. And this is on the common as a whole now. So we're not just looking at the, at the uh, within our 10 meters of the spot because it could be impacting just a, a small place and have a, a really significant impact. Um, so in the Scottish case, um, as I explained in the public goods talk, I think, um, we were only looking at species richness and the presence of trees. Uh, and in the case of the Western Isles one, of course, for, for blanket bog, it was a different matter. But on, on the rest of the, the areas, we were looking at habitat again. Um, and so the question there was, um, what's the impact of artificial drainage on the surrounding habitat. And if there wasn't any, we weren't penalizing. Um, but in Wales, we're looking at a, a wider range of public goods. Um, and it seems quite clear from talking to experts and from reading up on it that actually um, any artificial drainage um, is potentially negative for at least some of the public goods, even if it's not damaging to the immediate habitat. So it will, for example, contribute to releasing soil carbon. It will contribute to um, reducing the ability of the catchment to retain flood water. Uh, it may contribute even to the um, sending dung into, into reservoirs, for example. Um, so we're, we're asking, in our question, we're asking, is there uh, any artificial drainage? We're giving a negative for that. And if it's having impact on the habitat, we give a further negative. Um, and then the final one is, is quite clear, I think. Um, what's the impact of supplementary feeding? So we're not asking if it's happening. We don't, we're a results-based card. So is it having a negative impact on the, the common? That's all we're asking. Um, and then finally, um, the last question is a catch-all really. Um, it's asking about the scale or impact of any other damaging activity, but caused by the grazier. So we're not talking about um, fly, graze, um, fly tipping, we're not talking about arson, we're not talking about uh, scrambling, off-roading, we're just talking about things that the graziers are doing and which are associated with the management by the graziers, um, which is not an easy uh, thing to determine always, of course, we do realise that. Um, so we're, we're penalising that, obviously, um, especially if it has impacts on soil or water. Um, so just to talk something about grazing, this was a question that was raised in the, the actual seminar, the actual live seminar. Um, so I thought we should maybe address it a bit. Um, so grazing is clearly an issue potentially. Um, it can have really damaging impacts on a common if it's done poorly. So these are two examples from, I think both of them are from Ross. Um, common. So this is wildfires that's occurred and you can see it's gone down into the soil um, and it's, you know, it's contributing to erosion here. You can see there's, there's a, actually an a incised bit there of erosion um, going down into watercourses. It's not good for carbon storage. It'll take a long time to recover, etc. 
Um, but we're aware that the, the full picture of grazing is really um, more complicated than that. It's not just a matter that all grazing is bad. Um, so I think the, the first point I would make is that it's an issue, I think, for all approaches. So it's not just an issue for this results-based um, area payments way of doing things, but it's also uh, an issue for an action-based glass steel type um, scheme, which is also concerned with achieving results. Um, it's really not easy at all. I, I'm, I'm, yes, I, I'm, I'm, we, we are aware of that um, and how to achieve the best result in a pragmatic way is the real question, isn't it? Um, I think there has to be a long-term aim of reducing the incidence of fires, even of controlled managed fires, I think, potentially to zero. I think if you look at the, the broad sweep of the public goods, um, not necessarily the carbon in itself, if you can have a, a, a control fire which has minimal impact on the carbon, but if you're looking at wider biodiversity, more than just the, the persistence of, of heath and plants, if you're looking at vertebrates and reptiles, um, and also if you're looking at um, flood risk management, um, burnt areas, they really do have a, uh, they are more flashy in their response to rainwater. Um, there is a whole range of reasons, I think, why you'd want to reduce it over the long term. Uh, and of course, in some habitats, you completely want to avoid fire. You don't want it at all. Um, but maybe that's a long-term aim, uh, and the immediate aim should be to avoid wildfire, to avoid avoid fire that's really damaging um, because it's really hot, um, or that can spread to property, of course, and endanger life. Um, and that any fire that is used is used in a lawful and controlled and planned and safe way um, and is sort of within the tent, if you want to put it that way. We don't want to have fires happening outside the tent because the rules for being in the tent are too, are too severe. Um, and that is a real dilemma how to achieve that, I think. It seems to me that we should be trying to move away from the use of fire to manage habitats and pasture. Um, you notice that the fire service is mowing more and more these days um, and in the case of pasture then pasture management ideally is done by grazing um, and if it's not achievable if it has to be um, augmented by fire year after year then maybe there should be another look at the grazing system um, but whatever um, I think what the, um, the fire service would say and what we hear from um, projects like um, healthy hillsides that um, Harv was presenting to us in the in the stakeholders workshop the other day is that um, re we really need to integrate all the measures necessary into one workable package and I would say also all the agencies necessary um, so not just the fire rescue service but the police for example um, and law enforcement um, and we don't want to create a situation where it's easier for the grazier on the one hand, maybe to let things go. Uh, so we want to encourage appropriate activity um, because as the, the fire service um, point out, if we let things go, then the fuel load just builds up. And in the end, we depend as Craig Hope would say on the arsonist to keep them safe, which is to keep us safe, which is really not a sustainable way forward at all. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to create a situation where um, graziers themselves hide behind arsonists, you know, where you, it's easier for you to drop a, a match and walk away um, than it is for you to go through the process, get the procedures and the training and all this. We want the, the lawful, the, 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 the system we want to encourage, we want that to be easy enough that people will take to it by default, that it's not something that they try and avoid. So we want responsibility taking and we want the thing to work well, of course. Um, so how that works in practice, it needs a lot of thought and discussion, I think. Um, it needs more work by the agencies, clearly. Um, but it may, it may end up in the situation where um, a fire, um, 
which is properly carried out, which comes under a, maybe a mandatory management plan and which doesn't damage the soils, maybe we don't penalize that. You know, we just recognize that at least for the time being, it's a, it's a necessary evil. Um, but of course, even though I'm saying we're not penalizing it, it clearly will have a knock on impact on structure and species. It clearly will, and it will impact them. Um, and so there'll be a reduction in score. And maybe the reduction of score in itself um, is incentive to be trying other things, especially if there's um, capital works, um, payments there and training there and support there um, to make other, other ways of doing it uh, more viable. Um, but that's definitely something for discussion. And it's, uh, it's something I think we would say that Welsh Government um, needs to really um, do more work on. So not to see um, fire as a separate issue from agri-environment and agriculture policy, and not to see um, antisocial behaviour management and you know, reduction as being separate from fire and as being separate from, you know, so it all needs to be seen in a, in a holistic and um, coherent package, um, but that's easier said than done, and we recognise that. Um, I mentioned the app, so this is just a, well, it's a screenshot showing not much, but there's a question there, are there more than 20% um, dwarf shrubs and one of the benefits of the app as well as you know being an easy way to take down the um, the information uh, and being an easy way to to record the, the location is that it takes you through the questions one by one so you don't have to do this skipping through the, the sheaf of papers to find the right place and it's a much more um, user-friendly um, way of doing things potentially um, just to just to illustrate the the way we think that the the card would be a, a benefit to to the way graziers think about things to to think about things more holistically so let's say that these are the um some some areas some blocks in in a, a particular common um so you can see let me see the pointer um you can see here that there's a, an area which is light in color um i see that the, my line has moved for some reason but anyway um so this area is light in color, and this area is dark in color, and this area is dark in color. So they're clearly different. Um, and what we find is that um, this area actually has been mown by the graziers. Um, so they were told and they responded to a signal from somebody, from Bastier or somebody, um, to say that mowing was good because the structure is poor. Um, but what they did was they mowed a large area here um, and they didn't mow anything here. Um, and so the structure um, while on average, the result is the same. Uh, in detail, of course, the structure isn't what you want, actually. Um, and so when you score it, um, compared to this one down here, which has a score of four, you find that only gets a score of three because the structure is it's too short. It's, it's universally short. Um, and whereas that also gets a score of three um, because it's mostly long, okay? Um, and then interestingly, this next bit, um, this bit, where are we? This bit here, um, in structure terms, is very similar to this. But what it also has um, is um, Sitka cell seeding from this NRW presentation here. Uh, and so we're against that. We, we, we strongly mark that down as an encouragement to, to react, of course, as a, an encouragement to um, get to grips with them. Um, and so that's the, let's say that that's the, um, the signal that the car gives. Well, what does that mean then? Well, what it means is that if the graziers can um, moderate their mowing practice on, on that left-hand parcel, then they potentially could go up a point. Um, and the, by the same token, if they did a bit more mowing in an appropriate way in that next parcel, then they could also go up a point. But, but in this last parcel, they could go up four points, of course, um, if they got rid of both the Sitka um, and they um, initiated a, 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 an appropriate mowing pattern. Yeah, um, and so it was quite interesting that uh, I heard the when I presented this to the graziers, the graziers themselves um, realized that actually um, they might not need a, a capital works incentive here to do the the cutting of the sitka. It might be that the reward of having um, a score of four every year. Um, going forward would be enough of an incentive in itself um, for them to respond to. 
Um, so they wouldn't have to fill out forms and do a claim or any of this kind of thing. It would just be something that emerged from the card. So that's the kind of thing we want the card to achieve. Um, and that's the kind of thing that it has the potential to achieve, I think. Um, so a, um, a much more detailed, and of course, this is um, this is just at the block level. And our scoring wouldn't be at the block level. It would be at a number of points within the block. So it'd be much more detailed than this. And in each case, there might be things that the Glaziers could do um, to improve their score. Um, so it's not necessarily, of course, the low scores, which can be improved easily. You might have a score of seven and be easily able to get to eight and a half. Or you might have a score of three and not be able to change it at all or only be able to, to go up half a point. And so you need some, um, some help, I think, to, to um, start working through this. But once you got into it, I think it would be a, uh, an empowering thing for the Graziers. Uh, one which, as somebody said on the... Um, on the, the video in the in the stakeholders seminar um, would let them take charge of managing the biodiversity with, and the other public goods within their common. Okay, so that's the um, the end of what I wanted to say um, today. Um, apologies again that it was me saying it and that um, those of you who went to the Monday night seminar won't see exactly what you saw then. Um, just to remind you that all the videos are available or um, when they're loaded up, obviously, on the YouTube channel of EFNCP. Um, and you can also link to them from our Facebook page for the project. Um, <clears throat> and that the last um, webinar is on Monday night at half past seven. Um, you should have a link if you have a link to this one. Um, and if you don't, you can um, email me and, and get a link. Um, and the, the theme then would be um, the implications of this new way of implementing the scheme. So to go further into how it's different um, and what it could mean for commons governance um, and for advice and support. Okay, so that's the end of, of tonight's seminar. Um, so thanks very much for joining us uh, and hopefully see you next week. <laughs>